Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing series in Central Region of Science Sharing uh, Webinars. And today, uh, we have a repeat performance uh, by Lance Rothfuse, who's the Deputy Chief of the Warning R&D Division and currently Acting Deputy Director of NSSL. And he'll be talking about what he calls FACETS, a new watch warning paradigm and framework for progress. So without further ado, uh, Lance, it's all yours. Um, so what, what we started looking at here at NSSL is this, uh, you know, what are the challenges? What are the things that uh, we're, we're dealing with in our current warning methodologies? Um, a lot of this grew out of the Weather Ready Nation activities and uh, sort of spurred on by that. I'll get to that in a minute. But one of the, a smoking gun issue for me was this image that Greg Carbon put together, Storm Prediction Center here in Norman. Um, in this image, you see that the pink area, if you add up all the area uh, included in tornado warnings in 2011, that's what you see in the pink area. So sort of graphically re represented there. The total Na National Weather Service tornado warned area is in pink in 2000, for 2011. Whereas the impacted area, um, uh, ba uh, tornado, or impacted by tornadoes, is in that red dot. For me, this screams perceived false alarm. When you start talking about the area that is actually impacted versus the area that was warned on, and you see it graphically there, um, we have a, a high false alarm rate or perceived false alarm rate just in our aerial coverage. And so that sort of lends to the first bullet I've got on the screen there, that, that warning polygons in their, in their current formulations are rather blunt instruments for communicating this dynamic, small-scale, and multi-phenomenon threat. I mean, granted, when we put out a tornado warning, we're not just talking tornado. We're also talking hail, uh, damaging winds, and such. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blunt instrument is about the best way I can say that. And then we end up doing things like this with our polygons that the end users on the receiving side uh, really have, have trouble with. And I, I show this just as an example, not to pick on, on Brownsville, but I, I think every office has found themselves in this sort of situation. You look at this and you wonder how the, four, the, poor, the poor folks in Sebastian, Texas, are responding to, uh, to the onslaught of polygons. Where are they? Are they in? Are they out? Or what is their their situation, so at some point they just kind of get overloaded by it all. New science and technology are changing the way we predict severe weather. With advanced computer models, forecasting where a tornado will touch down even an hour or two from now is no longer just science fiction. The NOAA National Severe Storms Lab hopes to capitalize on this technology with a project called FACETS, short for Forecasting a Continuum of Environmental Threats. It's a complete reinvention of the watches and warnings the National Weather Service currently uses. When the Weather Service issues a tornado warning now, it's for a very large area, and everybody in that area gets the same message. What we are doing with FACETS is honing in on the area where the threat is greatest and individuals will get their own bit of information every half mile, updated every two minutes, so that it becomes a personal forecast telling you exactly what your risk is at that location. So imagine you're sitting at this dot and you now see that there is no tornado warning in effect, but your relative threat of tornadoes is starting to increase. It's still increasing as the storm approaches, it's increasing some more. Now the tornado warning is issued. And so for people who have low risk tolerance, like hospitals or schools where they need advance notice, if we can give information indicating that there's a lower risk but it's increasing before the standard warning would be issued, they can take action ahead of time and have a longer lead time to protect the people that they're serving. Another example shows where you are outside the tornado path, but you're in a tornado warning, but the path of the tornado is actually to the north of that location. So even though they were in a warning, with the facets approach, they didn't get overwarned for an event that did not hit them. Before facets can go live, there's still much work to be done. 
Researchers are working with both forecasters and social scientists to ensure information is communicated clearly and that people know what to do. Learn more here and follow us. Most of agriculture, you know, is directly driven by weather. For farmers, our interest is really being able to reduce the economic impact of weather, good or, or bad. So ultimately, it's about crops being produced more efficiently, being able to distribute those crops to market more efficiently, and having a greater quality and greater amount also for that, that distribution. Also, to avoid uh, runoff of fertilizer or pesticides, that more efficient use of such supplies you know, also helps the farmer's bottom line. We believe precision farming driven by better weather forecasts can have a strong improvement on farm efficiency and therefore have an, a positive economic impact. But it's not just better weather forecasts, it's really trying to connect that to the, to the, to the farm processes. So for example, with irrigation, the system is all set up to put the water down in areas that are known to need it tomorrow and won't be wasted because of, uh, because of rain. Deep Thunder is, uh, refers to sort of our system and service around the business of weather. And so by the business of weather, it means understanding the impacts of weather on business processes. Um, and it's a capability that we've been working on here at IBM Research. And it's different than what you think about like weather forecasts on, on television. Getting the better weather forecast is ultimately insufficient, even though it's a prerequisite. We really have to connect that to the business. What we do is that we're starting with better weather forecasts and then coupling that to the analytics and visualization that connect to the business processes. So the weather is where we begin, the traditional services, weather is where they end. But an important aspect of what some of those services do is that they do collect meteorological data, and we build on that data. So an example of that is work we've been doing in Rio de Janeiro, where we are doing weather forecasts, then using the rainfall estimates to predict flash floods. In other cases, the, the modeling that we may introduce will be based on different techniques, like statistical techniques. So our ability to predict electric outages for a utility and the restoration effort, we use statistical modeling techniques that incorporate weather and outage and other data from the, from the utility company in order to create the appropriate model for a forecast. This has been very gratifying to see that uh, these ideas are being deployed, people are using it, it's having uh, impact, has the potential to, to save lives and property. It's, uh, doesn't get, <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. Just joining us again, we uh, we had Hans Wagner. He's with a company called Early Alert. Well, I want to welcome to the show his chief meteorologist, uh, Brian. Welcome uh, to Home Talk USA. Oh, thank you. I need to tell you, you as a weatherman uh, for well over 40 years, mm -hmm. you've seen uh, the tragedies of weather. You've seen the tragedies without having this information. How different this is, say, from a weather radio uh, or my alerts that we get on our, you know, our phones. Well, it's not a replacement. This is more of a supplement. So this is like another sensor. It's another means for you on a personal level to have something that you can ground truth or to be notified, especially in a significant event. Now, your NOAA weather radio is activated by the National Weather Service, your local office, and it's sent out through an emergency activation system so they'll send you you've probably seen the tone on televisions or on yeah. radio it means something you need to pay attention to so here you are at home you've got your no weather radio hopefully you've had it set up properly and it's going to go off and then you silence it you said oh my goodness so you take precautions on your safety plan at home and then nothing happens 
or it happens on the other side of the county yeah. because they don't have that resolution be able to define it that you actually are an imminent threat. And the same thing with your app for your phone. It's gonna tell you that there's an event or something that you need to pay attention. There's a tornado warning. So the problem with that is you're dependent upon the communication path. Okay. Okay, so what happens for a good, good example? Uh, most of the time, not so much during Cindy, in some areas possibly, but during Isaac, we had widespread power outages. So here I am at home, I have no cable TV, I have no power, unless I have a generator, but that doesn't matter because the cable networks are down anyway locally. Okay, also my phone, because of the event, a lot of times you don't have that voice or you're not getting that connectivity on that, you possibly can do text. So you're not necessarily gonna get that advisory or that warning. So what else do you have? So with our device, we've basically designed it so that you have something at home to notify you that within a 30 mile radius that you have a threat. Then you can try to uh, you know, look at possibly where that threat is. Yeah. But because of the different functionality of that with the audible alarm, with the strobe, if you're asleep, it'll wake you up. You'll be able to take precautions. And because of the different states that it identifies, you'll know that if it's a tornado risk, that means there's something yeah. out there. Your technology gets its information from the weather service or the Doppler radar? Neither. Oh, okay, now, all right, I was kind of confused. Okay, explain that. Well, obviously a Doppler weather radar you see is comes from a Doppler weather radar system. So you have that antenna that is rotating that gives you a 250 mile area that will basically show you. But there's limitations on that. And a good limitation in our area is there's actually a radar hole by Baton Rouge. And that's because of the design of the radar and where it's located. Also, they have a big problem because this is 30 year old technology. If your power's out or if there's a, ra a lightning strike, that radar could be out. And that's actually yeah. what happened during Cindy. Yeah. And just recently when, you know, we had a couple of tornadoes mm -hmm. in the area. So this basically allows you to put something in your safety home kit to protect my family and to have that so that if you have nothing else, you'll have that to be able to alarm so you can take your precautions and execute your safety plan. What kind of advice you can give us if the alarm is went off, there's a tornado in your area, it's uh, close, where do I hide? What do I do, man? Well, the main thing is to be aware, but also to have a plan. Now, we obviously live in an area that's prone yeah, to hurricanes. I can't, I can't get underneath the, the underpass. I can't get in the ditch and no. the subterranes and all that stuff no. I keep hearing. Well, normally in your home, the most safe place in your home, because we don't have storm shelters here. Yeah. We don't have underground bunkers. We don't have basements. So what you do have is your home. You want to put as many walls between you and between that uh, possible I, I got storm. You. The wall itself, so, which is the structure. Right. And you also, a good uh, point, uh, a good uh, precaution is to take a bicycle helmet. Or if you have to, you've heard of a lot of people that have survived by getting in a bathtub, pulling the mattress over them. You have to think and plan of that. If that's where wow. you live, that's what you need to do. You need to do.